Hi everyone, welcome to today's webinar. We've got uh, Mark Congreve from the Independent Consultants Australia Network here to talk about the future of chemical use in farming. And I'm also joined today by WeedSmart's Northern Extension agronomist, Paul McIntosh. So thank you for joining us, Paul and Mark. Um, before we kick into today's webinar, I just wanted to um, give you a bit of an overview of WeedSmart. So we're an industry funded communication platform um, communicating science back to weed control solutions around Australia. Um, and as you can see on the screen now, these are our stakeholders. Um, so everybody above the line are our financial contributors and everybody below the line are our in-kind stakeholders. So we greatly appreciate the support of these companies. Um, Paul, I'll hand over to you to introduce Mark and then we'll um, get into the webinar. Thanks. Thank you, Shannon. And uh, good, good morning and good afternoon, everybody out there in uh, webinar land. And good day back to you again, Mark. Thanks, Paul. How are you? Uh, well, we had about three spots of rain here on the Darling Downs last night, and we've got a southwesterly wind that's extremely cold, and uh, so it's slippers and jumpers at the present moment up here, and uh, we desperately want some rain in this part of the, part of the world, Mark. No worries. But anyhow, we'll, we'll get on with the future of use of chemical use in farming. Mark, you did something like this at the Summer Grains Conference last year, and it was an excellent presentation, and, and today will be no exception with all your skills and uh, experiences. So I'll pass over to you to start the, uh, the, the Weeds Weren't webinar, the future of chemical use in farming. Yep. Okay, I'll jump into it. Um, thanks for having me on today. Uh, this presentation is basically a updated version of a presentation I gave to the Summer Grains Conference last year, and a lot of people found a lot of value in it. Um, what I'm going to try to do over the next 30 minutes or so is sort of dig into the crystal ball a little bit. Uh, try to look at what I see as some of the mega trends that are happening across the industry, what's happening around the globe. I don't profess to be any great futurist or have any great insight. I just like to try to keep a handle on you know, what's going on out there in chemical land, in, uh, in particular in agricultural land. So I want to talk about what I see as some of the things that are really driving at a macro level where we're going to head over the next few years, some of the international things that might be at play that are going to impact on us um, and probably wrap up today with a few specific issues around glyphosate and paraquat because they're obviously important to our weed control side of things, but also a couple of topics which generally people are interested in with the press that some of those uh, particular herbicides have had over the last few years. So I'm going to move through things relatively fast. Uh, Paul and I will probably break a couple of times through the presentation, see whether there's any questions that we want to address. Otherwise, we can come back and address questions at the end of the webinar. So what do I see as the key things moving forward? And uh, I guess I sort of started here with climate change. Um, not going to spend a lot of time talking about climate change, but certainly, in my view, is impacting on what we're seeing happen out in the field. Uh, I see the big issues being uh, for those that are operating in the irrigation system, we're going to have less irrigation water available and more demand for it, growing more crops and more people. So the conflict over water isn't going to go away anytime soon as I see it. We're certainly seeing summer crops moving south. Um, so, you know, we've already got, you know, cotton growing down into Victorian postcodes and a number of other crops is tending to move south that way. I think that trend's probably likely to continue. Uh, with extra heat, we're going to see faster insect life cycles, so they're going to be giving, probably giving us more grief, particularly over the summer months. And those more, I've called it heat waves there, um, but, you know, hotter temperatures are probably going to mean that the opportunity for spraying is going to be somewhat restricted, particularly over those summer months, and going to give us some more headaches trying to manage summer sprays. Just as one quick data set to back up where I'm sort of going here, um, Hydrophilic herbicides, particularly those water-based herbicides, and glyphosate's our classic um, that falls into this camp. Uh, they are particularly sensitive to, well, the weeds, how the weeds react in the presence of hot temperature. So that's just a data set there on barnyard grass. It doesn't just happen with barnyard grass, but showing that, um, I've got the screen pointer up here, um, LD50 rates, so the dose to control 50% of the weeds uh, in susceptible weeds that are growing at 20, 25 degrees versus when they're exposed to 30, 35 degrees, you need about two and a half times more glyphosate regardless of whether they're susceptible or resistant to get to the same level of control. That's just the weeds thickening their waxy cuticle in response to those higher temperatures. It makes it harder for a product like glyphosate to penetrate. 
So glyphosate becomes more challenging in hotter temperatures. We probably know that most uh, growers just um, increase application rate, but when you're starting to stack glyphosate resistance on top of that, things become even more difficult, particularly over those summer sprays. Um, put a slide in here on some of the movement of pests that we're seeing. And this to me seems like it may even be increasing over the years. So, you know, in 2006, we saw rough Russian wheat aphid uh, come into Australia and all those red uh, little aphids on that little chart there, uh, where rough Russian wheat aphid has spread since 2016. So only in four seasons, we've got pretty widespread um, populations across the Southern states. Fall armyworm, uh, we only first identified it uh, coming into the north of uh, northern Queensland in February. And since then, it's already moved down to central Queensland, across the Northern Territory, across to the top of WA. So we're seeing that pest move really fast and that's got some pretty big ramifications for the Northern farming system. Um, what else have we seen? We've seen lots and lots of hay moving uh, over the last couple of years through the drought and probably a lot of resistant weed seeds moving in that hay. And this summer, I've had lots and lots of questions about our friend Feathertop Rhodes grass uh, moving around and being found in different paddocks that we haven't seen before and certainly getting you know, sort of well down into New South Wales and potentially crossing borders even further south than that. So we're seeing a lot of these uh, weeds, you know, maybe partly driven by changing climate, but just partly by the processes and the factors that are determining what we're doing out in the field. So I think that's going to continue to uh, evolve. The other thing which I spend a lot of time in is sort of talking about uh, spraying. And I've sort of tried to uh, sum up this slide of looking at the drive, what I call the drive for efficiency versus the quality of application. So we're generally growing, a, you know, running larger farms with the, some of the restrictions that are going on, less number of hours to actually uh, apply those. We're seeing more optical sprayers come into the mix, certainly in the north, um, much faster sprayers to get across the country more. So all driving for efficiency um, and more targeted uh, tank mixing that's also going on as well all around efficiency. And then on the other hand, we're looking at the quality of application. So we're asking growers often to do more double knocks to get better levels of control. And that you know, may go against the drive for efficiency. More water uh, rates, higher uh, droplet, larger droplets, more water rates, that again can conflict with efficiency. More applications from resistance, trying to target smaller weeds, uh, often trying to get growers to slow down to get improved coverage and less tank mixing uh, from compatibility and uh, antagonism points of view. So we've got this real conflict of, uh, you know, at one stage we're trying to do everything more efficiently, but it is in some situations affecting the quality of the job. And so that's going to be a continual tension as I see it as we move forward uh, in the years. Neither of those are going away, those factors. Spray drift need to sort of touch on that. Won't spend a lot of time talking about spray drift, but certainly uh, a lot of people who have been following the media would have seen a lot of issues over the last couple of years uh, with regard to spray drift, um, particularly coming out of damage to cotton, but not only to cotton. It's not just a cotton problem. We really must keep any of the products that we're applying on the paddock that they're applied. Um, we've got other issues with you know, contamination from drift going across into pastures, into um, you know, livestock, as well as physical damage from herbicides. So there's lots of issues that we need to ensure that we're keeping our herbicides on the paddock that they're applied. And how do we do that? It really comes down to the choice of spray setup and particularly the choice of nozzles. So there's a little graph there, um, which is out of some work that GRDC funded uh, in the last couple of years, where they looked at a whole suite of summer herbicide um, mixtures across a range of three different nozzle types, different nozzle uh, spectrums, and then a whole range of adjuvants either added by themselves to water or added to the various different herbicides. Way too much data to present. But the key point I'm trying to make here is the big issue on the amount of driftable fines comes from the choice of nozzle. So if you're at the fine end of medium, you know, you've got potentially something like 20% of the spray volume may be prone to drift. 
we need to be getting up into you know coarse and up into the ultra coarse, very coarse ultra coarse type spray qualities to really be able to reduce that droplet. And by doing something like the choice of adjuvant, that will have a small impact, but it's really not going to be able to uh, fix problems of the poor choice of nozzle in the first place. So I probably won't spend too much time on spray drift, otherwise we'll be here all day. Uh, herbicide resistance. We can't come on to a weed smart uh, webinar without at least acknowledging herbicide resistance. So I'm sure everybody that's on this uh, webinar understands the issues we're facing and the strategies that we need to be implementing to manage herbicide resistance. While we continue to have a weed control program, which is heavily herbicide based, we're going to largely increase the amount of herbicide resistance we're going to need to deal with. So from a weed smart point of view, it's the big six uh, that we've got up there. So rotation, uh, mixing herbicide modes of action, mix and rotate, crop competition, double knock where we can. The real big focus is stopping that weed seed uh, set and stopping that uh, replenishment of the next generation and harvest weed seed management, all really important messages um, to reinforce as we move forward with regard to weed control. Where are we seeing resistance kick in? It's predominantly whatever the grower is using as the main part of their weed management approach. So in summer cropping regions, where's our weak link? It's really fallow management. Um, so we're seeing a lot of glyphosate and some more and more paraquat resistance emerging. So that's the primary one that's giving us concern. In winter cropping, it's been the in-crop selective herbicides because that's what we've been putting the pressure on the system for the last 20 years and they've broken. We've moved more towards pre-emergence in the last couple of years and that's obviously the one we need to watch from a uh, resistance point of view. So what are we going to do if we don't uh, manage um, herbicide resistance? Well, I threw this slide in when I was presenting up north and I said, well, maybe our options will come down to is our weed control going to be battery powered, hydraulic powered or petrol powered? Uh, that's probably a little bit facetious. Hopefully we don't get to that stage where we've got to be using um, slashing or mowing for all our weeds. But what key drivers do I see happening in that weed space? I guess the big one we're seeing already right now is increased use of residuals as we're seeing some of those post-emergent herbicides starting to fail. So in the winter crop space, we've seen a number of new pre-emergent herbicides in the last uh, five to particularly this year. We're seeing a lot of new uh, products come to market. I've just thrown up a few brand names there, which are relatively new introductions into the mix. There's um, others that I could have added to that slide. So if you're working for one of those companies, don't feel offended that I haven't added your particular product. I couldn't add everything on there. And there's three or four more new ones to come over the next couple of years. So a big push into pre-emergent space. Unfortunately, the cupboard's still a little bit bare in the post-emergent space, um, at least in the short term. But hopefully we've got some you know, uh, stuff further down the pipeline uh, as far as new modes of action in that space coming. Uh, but don't expect those in the next year or two. Um, some other technologies. So obviously, you know, um, harvest weed seed control has been fairly big and there's been webinars on that one. So I haven't sort of talked about that one a lot. Um, one of the things which is really interesting and will certainly have a great fit in the north um, is the use of taking the So some people may have sort of seen that technology which has been developed and uh, being demonstrated out in the field over the last 12 months or so. 
my understanding is those units are uh, starting to be commercially manufactured now. So that might be something that's going to fit not every uh, farming system, but it will give us a non-herbicide option. Um, so that will be you know, more important to manage resistance moving forward. In the spraying space, uh, I'll probably drip, jumped ahead a little bit a few more years down the track, but this is sort of where I can potentially see us ending up, uh, you know, not too far down the track. Having something like an autonomous tractor and that technology is starting to come to market now, so that can be you know, out there in the field. We can potentially team that up with an onboard weather station, which would really dictate when we can spray. Uh, we're trying to manage drift and some of those issues. We can basically start and stop based off the weather conditions that are being determined from the onboard weather station. Teaming that up with camera technology. So we've had a lot of the um, infrared units, weed seeker units type and uh, weed it units running around out in the field using infrared to detect weeds. But the technology is moving towards actually using a camera, which will actually identify individual weeds and potentially speciate those weeds as well. So we can actually identify that you know there's individual weeds that um, and what type of weed they are. Once we can do that, and that technology is effectively right on our doorstep now, we can potentially set up our booms somewhat different to the way we've set them up in the past. Potentially, we could have multiple lines and multiple tanks and having a different brew in each of the tanks and the, uh, the camera identifies that's a ryegrass plant, that gets tank A, that's a uh, wild radish plant, that gets tank B and so on. Why am I sort of suggesting we might go down that path? That's going to potentially eliminate some of the antagonism that we're dealing with and we're going to be able to dial up a particular herbicide rate or a brew which can actually control some of those weeds that otherwise we might be struggling to control we we're trying to do one tank fix all type approach and the option this has with this uh, spray technology is we don't need 8,000 litres of a um, herbicide mixed up we're actually finding even with some of the um, camera sprays out in the field that you know an 8,000 litre tank might last a number of days and we're getting some compatibility issues in the tank from having you know, herbicides sitting around that long mixed up. So we might come back to you know, three or four 1,500 litre tanks rather than one 8,000 litre tank. And obviously to make all that work is we need herbicides and labels and use patterns. And so I think that's probably an issue where as an industry, we haven't given a lot of thought. The technology is almost coming faster than we've actually thought about how we're going to um, introduce products um, into that sort of technology. So a bit of a challenge out there for the agronomists, start thinking about how we might use some of this new spot spraying technology, both in crop and in the fallow, as we start moving forward and that technology comes to market. Paul, I might pause at this point in time and see whether there's any questions you wanted to address at that stage. Thanks, Mark. Um, I'm going well there. Look, I suppose a couple of, couple of questions come in. Um, Mark, I'll just summarise them because they're, they're fairly long. The use of residual herbicides is, is going to really get more overtaken or up, up to a cup here, I guess, in the northern region from what this question is. The biggest problem, of course, with that is the is the locking into a particular cropping cycle, and that's a real real issue for the future, isn't it? Like, do you think we'll go back to shielded sprays like you had a couple of versions put it there do you think we'll go back to that sort of thing in the in the future like it's a really slow job but it it gives you some pretty good options for a whole host of reasons and a pretty good little atmosphere underneath those shields for that sort of thing yeah we could go down that way um certainly very yeah those applications tended to work fairly well because they were very well targeted um and we got over some of those summer challenging conditions from an application point of view um yeah yeah, I think we're going to be seeing lots of different stuff as we move forward, and that will be one tactic in the shed. The, the, the one thing I can see, there'll be somewhere in the shed, somewhere left out, somewhere underneath an old tarp, but it's going to be, uh, uh, it's going to be an interesting sort of thing uh, for the future, where we, where we go with some of this stuff, Mark. But, you, you know, you're spot on with all your, your summations and where you're going with this talk. It's a great talk again. So I'll let you, uh, I'll let you keep going, Mark, until, uh, until the next section. Okay, no worries. So that's some of the macro trends I sort of see driving Australian agriculture. I wanted to sort of now probably broaden out a little bit and go a little bit more international. 
So I guess one of the key things that I really want to sort of uh, touch on is some of the issues around food safety and I guess maximum residue limits or MRLs and uh, driving, you know, the drive our food safety issues. Spend, won't spend a lot of time on this, but I just want to sort of highlight a few points. Um, I guess most growers out there basically have a view that, you know, I've used a product, um, I've adhered to the label with regard to application rates when we need to time that. And, uh, you know, maybe the view out there in uh, grower land is, yep, I've adhered to the label and therefore my produce is safe and ready to eat and ready to sell in that situation. It's a little bit more complex than that. Um, we have consumers out there that they're also, I guess their concern is, is my food safe to eat? And we've got you know, people across all sorts of spectrums uh, from saying that every chemical is bad, regardless of where it is, to others out there that are saying, um, you know, I trust the regulators to make sure that the quality of produce that's coming through the supermarket or through the grocery store uh, doesn't contain dangerous levels of uh, pesticides in it. We're talking about pesticides today. And so that's where the MRLs come in place. So, you know, they're basically expecting the regulators to, most growers, or most consumers are expecting the regulators to make sure that they've got that in place and providing our um, use of our chemicals isn't exceeding MRLs. Everything should be good. But then you've got a subsegment of growers that are basically saying, if we can detect a, a level of pesticide in our produce, that's all bad. And you can now go onto eBay, you can buy uh, pest kits for a few hundred dollars if you want to go down that pathway and test your own produce in your kitchen sink. Wouldn't advise it because you've got no quality control of how that testing's going, but there are people doing that now. And yes, they're going to find pesticides at some sort of level. It's not a question of whether it's a safe level or not, but there are some people out there, some groups out there that are you know, taking the very anti-chemical path. We're going to continue to hear from those, that sort of end of the spectrum. You've also got Customers, what I call customers, but you know those that are buying your produce, uh, they're also looking at you know this whole issue of MRLs and safety. And in a lot of situations, they're prepared to accept product produce providing it complies with the local Australian MRL. But others will start putting their own standards, I guess is the best word, over and above you know what the um, maximum residue levels and you know, withholding periods are. So anybody that's in the grape industry would know about the AWRI dog book that's been around for a long time, which tells you, tells you as a grower where you can use certain um, products in your wine grapes. Uh, doesn't really matter what's on the label. You have to follow what's in the dog book and they can be more restrictive than what's on the label. Uh, the barley industry in Australia that's going to malting has some pretty tight specs of to, you know, what they will accept and what they won't accept. Some of the supermarkets, not picking on coals there, I just use that because of some of their logos, they're putting a whole heap of programs in place um, around sustainable use, not just of pesticides, but of um, you know, produce in general. So we're gonna see more and more customers determining their own standards, which in some situations may be more restrictive than you know, what the label actually recommends. And then you get into the export market. So what are our export uh, operators looking like? they're really looking at how do the MRLs line up around the world. So we might have an Australian MRL, which allows a certain amount of uh, residue in the produce uh, when it's harvested. That may be different to the importing company, which they're trying to sell it to. They may have a different standard. Um, MRLs are basically set by how you're gonna use the product in your own country. Uh, so you'll set an MRL according to how you use it and different countries use herbicides and. Uh, chemicals in different ways, uh, so therefore may have different MRLs, or they may have no MRL at all because they don't use that product in their country. And so then you may be either focused uh, coming back to a default MRL, which will be very low, or some countries may uh, default back to Codex, which is an international system, but more and more countries are setting up their own uh, residue limits for a lot of the chemistry, and we have to try to match the produce we're selling to the export market we're trying to deliver it in. And that's becoming a very big issue uh, for a lot of our exporters. Um, it really comes back to detectable residues at harvest. So it's you know product that's being sold and you know, what uh, residue limit it has in there. So our use patterns that are used 
close to harvest are going to be the ones that are going to continue to raise questions in this um, uh, market segment. So any product that we are putting out relatively close to the harvest date is the ones that we're most likely to see uh, causing levels of concern. And particularly with our desiccants, if we're using glyphosate or paraquat as a desiccant, both of those two herbicides aren't actually metabolized by the crop. It's part of the reason why they're good herbicides, but the crop can't break them down. So if you go and spray them close to harvest, you are going to find residues. Um, it doesn't, if, you know, waiting a couple of days, it's not going to dissipate. So we have to make sure that we're very conscious of those type of applications. Um, so yeah, particularly from an export point of view, understanding you know, what happens uh, for those residue limits that are going out and you know, what happens when a country decides to withdraw product use in their country. Do they actually then withdraw the import tolerance for that herbicide as well? And Europe probably is the one that comes up a lot and gives us uh, you know, some sleepless nights when they're basically deregulating so many products. I've just put a list here of um, the year and the molecule which has been withdrawn from the EU. Uh, we obviously would have problems sending any of those uh, produce with any of those residues of any of those uh, chemicals into the EU, but it also gives us a bit of a wake up call as well as to how we would farm in an Australian point of view if we went down the EU approach and started to withdraw all of those herbicides you know, that I've added down the list there, which have already been lost uh, from EU. So um, yeah, haven't got a lot of time to go and talk about you know, EU specifically, but it's an interesting case study to look at over time. Mark, can I butt in that, that previous slide there about um, MRLs for different uh, pulse crops with my association with Pulse Australia, of course, one of the biggest bugbears I have, and I call it bugbear, but it's, it's understating it, is the, is the um, MRL levels have been exceeded for some of our pulse crop exports. And particularly the mung bean industry is very conscious of this stuff, but it's also been in some of our other pulse crops. So anyone who's listening out there, please abide by the label. And as Mark said, sometimes our label doesn't reflect what other seas countries might, uh, might impose on us. Yep, certainly back that up strongly, Paul, and talk to the purchaser of your uh, commodity and make sure that uh, you're aware of what they will accept and what they won't accept, particularly for those export commodities. Okay, um, changing tact slightly, um, I wanna talk a little bit about um, multinational herbicide discovery, or I guess herbicide discovery in general, which is largely driven out of the multinational um, chemical companies, and explain a little bit about what's going on in that space. So I guess what we've seen over the years is we've wanted to go to development of um, low use rate products and very specifically targeted products. Doesn't matter whether we're talking herbicides or insecticides or fungicides. So we've got this little uh, chart I've put together down here of just looking at actual active ingredient rates over the years and how you've seen a major decline. So if you go back into the 50s and 60s, a lot of products being used at you know, one to two kilos active per hectare, we're now down into the, often in the 100 to 200 grams per hectare. What's driving that? It's really cost of manufacture. If you're discovering a herbicide or an insecticide now, and it's gonna take a couple of kilos of product per hectare to manufacture, it's probably not gonna be commercialized because it's gonna to cost too much to build the manufacturing plants that are associated with the volume that's gonna be required. So low use rates is a really important driver and you can see we've made some great progress over the years. We're also tending to go for products which are very specific in their site of activity. Um, even better if that site of activity doesn't exist in mammals, so we can allay a lot of the, uh, the human safety concern, but we really want something that's very specific and very targeted. That makes our regulatory uh, and product testing a lot easier if we've got a very narrow uh, target where that um, insecticide or pesticide is going to work. The downside of having a product that's very targeted is that they're probably going to be much more likely to develop resistance. You get a very small change in the target site and all of a sudden that product's not going to work anymore. So on one hand, we've got companies out there you know, that are really looking for very targeted, um, easier to register um, actives. 
but they're probably going to be the ones that are going to be more resistant uh, prone. So that trend isn't going to go away. You're probably going to see a lot, you know, the new products that come to market are going to be, there may be exceptions, but they're going to be more likely to be higher risk for resistance point of view. What else is happening in discovery land? Uh, we are seeing increase, well, let's go to this slide first, years to first sale. We're seeing more years as we uh, keep evolving. It's taking longer to get from when you've discovered the product to when it actually hits the marketplace. Why is that? Because largely we're doing more testing and particularly more product safety testing as required to make sure we've got a safe product to deliver to the market. What goes hand in hand with that is if it's going to take you more years of trial work, it's going to cost more to bring that to marketplace. So you can see there's been a steady rise over the years of US dollars as to how much it costs to bring a product to market. Most commentators now are saying it's probably over 300 million US dollars to uh, get to market in today's dollars. Doesn't really matter whether we're talking an ag chem product or a new G GM trait, they cost roughly the same sort of money with roughly the same sorts of timelines to get to market. So what's that driven? Don't expect anybody to be able to read this slide, uh, but this is the consolidation of chemical companies over the years. And we're seeing all those uh, black names there were all um, chemical companies around the world at some point in time. And they've been largely consolidated into uh, the companies that we are aware of you know, there. And we've really got four big uh, players out there which are really still heavily focused on new discovery of R&D and then another smaller tier of some somewhat smaller companies and then still a few quite small companies playing around out there. We've seen a big consolidation and that consolidation continues over the years. So what's driving that consolidation? It's really around the cost of R&D at the big end of the, the marketplace. So I was talking about you know maybe 300 um, million US dollars to bring a new product to the marketplace. Most of your R&D focused um, multinationals will spend about seven to nine percent of their sales on R&D. So that's not seven to nine percent of profit, that's seven to nine percent of total revenue goes back into R&D. So if you're um, operating at around about that four to five billion in sales, um, that's going to give you an R&D budget of somewhere around the three or four hundred uh, million dollars a year to spend on R&D. You've got existing products which are still going to be supported with ongoing R&D. But it would probably, for every four or five billion dollars worth of sales, you could probably, over the long term, expect to maybe introduce one new active per year on a pretty consistent basis. So that's not one herbicide for Australia. That's one herbicide or fungicide or um, GM trait or anything like that, which may have a fit somewhere around the world. So it's not exactly, you know, it's quite con uh, quite challenging for these companies to be able to afford to justify that uh, stream of new products coming through. Uh, so if you look at the large multinational companies and where their sales are sitting at the moment, um, you've got, you know, companies around about the size of FMC, you know, still have a, uh, discovery objective within their pipe pipeline, but they're probably at about the limit as to where you can afford to justify running an R&D program. Um, BASF, a little bit bigger, Corteva, Syngenta, you know, these companies would, should be expecting to see, you know, two or three new active ingredients or new uh, GM traits coming out per year. Bayer, Monsanto, you know, the largest and probably have the biggest um, R&D program that backs that up. So that's where we're going to see new modes of action, um, new active ingredients and new GM traits largely come to market. This chart over here is sort of highlighting that, you know, as we went through from the 60s through to the 2000s, we we're seeing around about 100 to 120 new chemicals, new active ingredients coming out per decade. Substantial drop in the 2010s. Um, there will be, this is only chemicals in here. I don't have a data set of how many uh, GM traits that would be in there. And it certainly would push the number up higher when you add in GM traits. But we have seen a big decline as, in particular, a lot of the funding shift has moved towards GM technology. So that leads me into a couple of comments around GM technology. 
So I've made a comment here that I think GM technology is going to continue to expand. Um, from an Australian point of view, genetically modified uh, crops is really largely limited to glyphosate tolerance in cotton and canola, and at this point in time, Bolgard 3 or BT technology uh, used in cotton. We don't have a lot of GM traits uh, currently commercialised in Australia. I made a comment there that I would say there's probably little grower demand largely outside of cotton. Now, a few canola growers will probably disagree with that statement, but when I sort of look at it at a macro level, we're not getting a lot of grower and customer push uh, coming out of Australia to introduce new traits compared to some other places in the world. We've probably spent more time uh, thinking about non, what are called non-GM traits, so group C triazine tolerance, get my tongue around that, in uh, canola has been quite big over the last 10 to 15 years, and more and more group B tolerance in the clearfield space and more crops being added in the clearfield space. Um, ALS tolerance in sorghum has now just been commercialised and ALS tolerance in lentils and soya beans has also hit the marketplace. That's where we've been largely spending a lot of our um, effort. Compare that to the North Americas, and this is just a US slide that I put up here. Um, there's a lot of traits that are available in the US which haven't seen the light of day in Australia. So we've got commercially now 2,4-D tolerance, dicamba, glufosinate, FOP tolerance, a whole range of BT proteins that we don't have in Australia, drought tolerance, all coming from uh, GM technology. And there's just a sample of brands of different traits which I've sort of thrown up there which aren't available in Australia. So I've changed my slide a little bit over here. GM technology will continue to expand in the Americas. Why are we seeing the difference between Australia and America? My view is that it's uh, largely on the basis of this little diagram here. In Australia, we have most of the discovery of genetically modified traits and the regulatory component of getting those registered all around the world is largely falling with those big multinational uh, chemical companies, particularly Syngenta, Bayer and Corteva are the big ones in the trait uh, discovery and development. Trait introgression into our crops in Australia. So putting those traits initially, um, those, tr those GM traits or any other trait for that matter, um, into the crop is largely responsible for the GRDC in the grains or CSIRO in cotton. And then they hand that, once that initial trait has been put into the crop, it's handed over to one of the seed companies to realise it's a small snapshot of the seed companies. Just picked a few examples there to then put that into the varieties you actually want and breed those up and bulk those and deliver those to the marketplace. So we've really got three different groups of entities that aren't vertically integrated. And then we get into freedom to operate um, with any sort of you know, technology. Who's gonna do the development work? Um, do we have freedom to operate? Who's gonna e extract the value out of that proposition and the commercial arrangements that are there? So it becomes much more difficult when you've got many players. In North America, you've got these big multinationals who are basically doing the discovery work doing the regulatory work, doing the pre-breeding work and doing the breeding all within their organisation. Uh, so that's what's really driving the difference between those the different markets as I see it. How may that change? I'm not going to go into this in a lot of detail due to the time constraints, but some people may have heard of CRISPR-Cas9 technology, which is starting to gain lots of traction. It's not just going to be an agricultural driven technology. It's working in drug, um, you know, human health uh, issue, uh, disease management, a um, whole heap of different other factors who are also trying to use that technology. Pretty simply, what is it? It's genome editing, which is slightly different to genetic modification, which we've largely done to date with our GM crops. So with GM modification, what we're doing is we're getting a gene we want to insert from some other crop or other plant or uh, other animal or wherever it's come from, bacteria. And we're building that with a construct to make it work and firing into that into the DNA and hopefully find that it sticks in the DNA somewhere and we now have a plant that has a new gene in it. Genome editing by this technology is very much more specific 
we're basically coming along and we're cutting the DNA at a particular point where we know exactly what's going to happen and we're either letting the DNA repair itself or adding something or subtracting something from that DNA at that point in time. What's the key driver with that? Very specific editing of the DNA. Um, it's significantly cheaper to do than the old GM technology. So that may allow some smaller companies to move into that space. And it really depends on how this technology is regulated around the world. So one of the things that's going to happen with this genome editing is once you've actually edited the genome, it's, it's impossible to actually tell that that event has actually taken place. It's very different to GM where you can actually test and say, yes, that's had a different gene added to it. Genome editing, um, it's really just replicating what is happening out there in nature. So you can't tell a genome edited uh, crop or plant after you've done this technology. So if you can't detect it, how are you actually going to regulate it out in the field? So in the US, they've, it looks like they're going to take the approach that um, we're not going to regulate this type of technology because we can't police it. Europe is basically saying they want to um, still regulate it because it's still mucking around with the genome, but how are they actually going to be able to regulate it? And Australia's still trying to work out how we're going to approach it as well. So a lot of um, evolution is going to happen over the next 10 years or so driven out of this type of technology. Uh, Paul, any other questions that have come in before I move on to the last couple of topics that I wanted to cover off on? No, Mark, I'm just interested on your, um, your list of technologies to continue to expand GM technologies. And I looked at one there and it's called Drought Guard. And I'm thinking, crikey, somebody's, we need that one in Australia. But isn't it remarkable, Mark, that in all those ones you put there, those GM traits, there's a whole lot of herbicide ones or weed, weed ones. And you'd think that they've got themselves in enough trouble over there in America without breeding any more of those sorts of, uh, of GM traits. But Drought Guard certainly would interest us in Australia. Yeah, so the drought technology has really increased water use efficiency. Um, it's probably marketed as drought guard. It doesn't really still help you if you're in a true drought, uh, but it does, it's really water use efficiency, but still that would you know, be of quite use in Australia. Um, and yeah, I know a couple of companies have had a bit of a look at it, but I'm not aware of any actual uh, formal development projects that are actually happening down that space. But yeah, we are a country that could do with some better water use efficiency. Okay. Can you on Mark, please? No worries. So the last little bit I thought was worth touching on is um, specifically around a couple of the big uh, herbicides which are really important to us and glyphosate and paraquat and probably thought that yeah, we couldn't really um, talk about the future of chemicals without trying to at least give my view on how I see the evolution of some of the access to those technologies coming along. So I'm assuming probably everybody on the webinar would have heard about this glyphosate safety issues, um, particularly coming out of the US and the court cases that have been uh, associated with that. There's been plenty of media press, uh, which has sort of indicated that, you know, is glyphosate safe to use? To start with, I guess I'll touch on the court cases in the US. So there's been three court cases finalised to date. They're really driving around three key bullet points that I've put up here. So I'll come and talk to this one in a minute, but this IARC, the International Agency of Research into Cancer, listing glyphosate as a probable carcinogen. Talk about that on the next slide. They're claiming a link to non-Hodgkin's lymphoma in particular as one of the types of cancer. And probably which is really fundamental and probably gets missed a little bit in the media coverage is a lot of the court case activity is around should the suppliers warn customers of this potential link to cancer rather than specifically does it cause cancer or not? So you've got an organisation saying we believe it does. Um, a lot of those court cases, particularly in California, where they have a, um, uh, forgotten the, the actual name of the legislation, but they've got legislation in there that basically says that if in simplistic terms, if your product is, causes cancer, you need to warn users uh, of that uh, potential possibility. 
Now you've got you know, Bayer slash Monsanto saying, we don't believe that you know, glyphosate does cause cancer, so why are we going to go and warn customers? State of California are saying, it's on the list, you're not warning customers, therefore um, we're sort of uh, gonna take action down that pathway. So what's actually happened, we've had three cases completed, some very large damages were awarded, they've been appealed, a lot of those were reduced, some of those have been further appealed and been reinstated. That appeal system is ongoing, so we haven't actually got to a final position where they're at. When I put this slide together uh, for uh, the original presentation I gave probably about 12 months ago, a bit less than 12 months ago, there was 13,000 claims. Most commentators now are saying the claims against Bayer Monsanto is in excess of 50,000. I've heard 75,000 being mentioned. Not sure whether that's accurate or not, but it's uh, certainly in the tens of thousands now. And there is some talk of you know, maybe um, class actions happening and also maybe you know, Bayer doing settlements uh, to claimants, but nothing's actually being formalised at this stage. So it's still watching brief. Has slowed down with the courts being shut down to a lot of the COVID-19 uh, side of things. So it's gone a bit quiet in the last couple of months. From an Australian point of view, the first case has been initiated in Victoria. Um, but that hasn't gone to trial at this point in time. So it'll be interesting to see what happens with that one. So how do we get to that stage? Very simply, I'll try to sum it up. Um, this International Agency for Research in Cancer, IARC, has listed back in 2015, this glyphosate as a probable carcinogen. They do a hazard assessment. So they're just basically saying, can glyphosate cause cancer? Not looking at how we use it, not looking at the application rates, just can it cause cancer? And they said, we believe probably it can. They've put it into the same classes, for example, eating red meat, burning wood, doing shift work, um, a lower category than things that we you know, sort of take for granted each day. But it is on that list of you know, a potential probable carcinogen. So hence, that's where it sort of started and around the world and saying, well, if it's on that list, why aren't we doing state uh, situation? Won't we take them steps to manage it? The regulatory authorities take the hazard and look at the exposure and do a risk assessment. So basically they're saying, okay, we might have a hazard, um, but how are we actually gonna manage the risk of that? So what application rates are we gonna use? What withholding periods are we gonna use? What uh, personal protective gear are we gonna use? Can we manage the risk, not just to cancer causing agents, but to any agent which is toxic to um, us as users or consumers? And all of those regulatory agents are saying, we believe glyphosate is safe when we use it as per the label. It's also been this largely publicized agricultural health study um, in the US. We've had thousands of uh, growers tracked over time and looking at that and the initial conclusions out of that AHS study uh, couldn't come up with a link to glyphosate causing cancer within a, pop a large population of agricultural users. It has got a little bit more confusing. There's this paper, which if anybody's really interested, is worth getting a hold of and having read this paper from Zhang in 2019. So they went back and did a meta-analysis. So basically reviewed a lot of other studies, including this AHS study, and they cut the data and tried to find just really high level um, exposure, people that had very high level exposure to glyphosate. And their conclusion, they've come up with a 41% increase in non-Hodgins lymphoma in that high exposure group. So it does cause you know, some consternation in some people. Uh, I believe that you know, if we use glyphosate according to our label, it's perfectly safe to use, but you can see how uh, different media commentators are picking up on the narrative that they're trying to support um, on either side of the fence. So I'm probably gonna leave the, site, or the, the, uh, the political positioning at that point in time. What's happened to glyphosate around the world in recent years? Has it been banned around the world? Get that question a lot. So in no particular order as I go across this, this is my understanding of the major countries which have taken some sort of action against glyphosate at this point in time. So Luxembourg this year are probably the first country to actually actively take steps to remove glyphosate from the system. I don't think Luxembourg's gonna have a lot of impact on the global use of uh, glyphosate but they're in the process of uh, removing glyphosate completely from their jurisdiction. Austria, um, 
passed legislation in about June or July 2019 to totally remove glyphosate. They then had to change a government and the new government hasn't actually enacted that legislation. So technically it's passed parliament, but it hasn't actually been enacted. So glyphosate still currently being used at this point in time. France, back in 2018, President Macron uh, made a public statement saying he wants glyphosate gone by 2021. That's been revised back to, well, maybe 80% reduction would be a good thing, um, but nothing's actually happened at this point in time to legally make that process happen. Thailand announced in 2019 they were going to totally ban glyphosate. They've backed down on that and come back to, we want to restrict glyphosate use. Sri Lanka banned it in 15, reinstated it back in 2018 because growers weren't able to manage their weeds. Vietnam is probably the one that's of most significance to me. They've announced that they want to uh, stop all use of glyphosate by 2020. It's gone a little bit quiet in the last couple of months, June 2020, it's not very far away. Haven't actually seen whether that's, at, my understanding is that's still in place at this point in time. They are the fourth largest market for Australian wheat. So if they do go ahead with that, and at the same point in time, they withdraw tolerances, MRLs for import, that could have significant impact for our wheat exports. So that's one to watch in that space. So what I actually see happening um, from an Australian point of view, I think we've got an excellent review process um, underway by our regulators and you know, they are evaluating the risk of glyphosate and there's no, no red flags that I'm seeing that are coming out from the APVMA that cause me great concern. What I can see happening is the use of glyphosate is probably gonna get too hard for some councils to manage regardless of whether it's um, whether there's any legislation changes or not. And I think you're gonna start seeing some councils start switching away from glyphosate. They're probably gonna do stuff like um, automatic um, mowing robots. You're starting to see that happening well. You'll start seeing that happen at night. So we get away from traffic issues to some degree and get away from people listening to mowers that are going on. Uh, that's gonna be okay in the major cities. That's gonna be where most of the pressure is gonna come from glyphosate. Uh, but you're going to, you know, uh, the cities have got relatively low areas to mow as far as the you know, length of roads to get to manage, and they've got a fairly big revenue base, and they're going to be able to afford the increased costs that are going to come to it. I see it a little bit more problematic for some of the rural councils, which have got thousands of kilometres of roadside to manage and haven't got a great revenue base coming in. Uh, that's going to be more difficult if they're under pressure. Um, from constituents to remove the use of glyphosate in that roadside market. Obviously, if there's billions of dollars worth of litigation uh, coming out of some of those US cases, how's that going to impact on the supplies of glyphosate? It's only been Monsanto they've gone after to this point in time, but I suspect others will be dragged into, other supplies will be dragged into that litigation if it continues. And as I sort of alluded to a bit earlier, those use patterns close to harvest are going to be the ones that are going to come under more and more concern. Um, we're going to need additional segregation costs. If we start losing MRLs in the markets that we're exporting to, i.e. we're going to have to have glyphosate treated versus uh, non-glyphosate treated crops because the glyphosate is going to be present if you're using it at harvest, relatively close to harvest. So they're the key issues that I sort of see things how it eventuates. Better kick it along a bit, Mark, for time-wise. Yep, a couple more slides, I'm done, thanks, Paul. Okay. Uh, the last, the other one I wanted to touch on as well is paraquat diquat and where we're at. I'll move through this one pretty quickly. So paraquat, you can see there, you can read this, that um, you know we've seen regulatory constraints on paraquat in a number of countries already. Uh, China's the interesting one, that they're removing paraquat from their own use, but they're still allowing paraquat for export and they, are responsible for about 80% of the global supply of paraquat. Um, so they're going to export it to the rest of the world, but they're not going to use it locally. There's some changes to the USA, not restricting the product, but some changes to use patterns happened last year. And there's more countries which are reviewing it right now. So we're going to see more activity uh, coming with regard to paraquat as we move forward. In Australia, there's a review ongoing. It's been ongoing since 97. The tox has largely been considered to be okay. There's still the operational health and safety 
Richard Hughes environment, particularly the OHS, is the one that still is yet to be finalised to see whether there's any changes to the way we would be requiring to use the product. Uh, DICWAT was removed from the EU in 2019, so that's a change relatively recently that we're going to have to you know, sort of uh, learn to deal with. So I guess I've sort of summarised that one as that these global restrictions are increasing. Watch what's happening in China. Um, if they made any uh, restrictions to their production side of things, that could have a substantial impact on the global market for paraquat. And again, it's these pre-harvest use patterns are the ones that are going to come under lots and lots of concern. So just wrapping up, um, I want to leave one really positive message and one thing that we can probably all do a better job of, I think, out in the field, is we've got some really fantastic wins in agriculture in general, but also how we're using chemistry. And I think we really need to document and communicate those wins outside of talking to ourselves, talking to the wider community. Things like the harvest weed seed control um, and taking the pressure off our resistance management and in default our herbicides. Uh, a great Australian story, we need to be seeing that from the treetops, um, regardless of which form we're doing. Incorporate by sowing technique. Nobody else in Australia has really taken on board, well, really understands that technique. It's given us the ability to put a whole heap of new chemistry into a marketplace. We're basically taking uh, herbicides which are toxic to wheat and barley and using them in wheat and barley. That's a, effectively an Australian innovation that we really need to be singing from the, the rooftops. Uh, helicoverpa management, how we've managed, how we've changed um, helicoverpa management in the northern grains region in particular, where we were in the late 1990s uh, being smashed by uh, resistance to all our insecticides. We've changed insecticides, we've bought in biologicals, we've bought in BT cotton, and we've largely got that back under control. Uh, improve fallow management, water use efficiency, how we're managing the yield out of our summer crops, optical sprayers, those double knocks, managing spray drift. Some really good uh, sort of messages there that we really need to you know, deliver. And I really think we need to do a better job of you know, writing these up as case studies and in particular showing an industry-wide economic analysis of the benefit that we've got there so we can sell our message to the non-ag community. At that point, Paul, I'm going to pull up. Um, obviously, we're sort of running probably a little bit over time. Um, acknowledge GRDC and some of the uh, resources they've given me to you know, do some of this extension stuff. I'm going to throw it open for any questions, if there are any. Mark, at just one point, I think that last slide, document and communicate our wins, is a first class slide. And uh, we should do that with all those points you've just mentioned there with that, that, um, that one slide, those case studies and analysis and all this stuff is first class. And I've got one question, Mark, down here, which we might only have time for, Shannon, possibly. Uh, do you foresee mechanical weeding as a threat to chemical herbicides given resistance and I think it's longer R&D cycles? Um, no, I don't see it as a threat. I don't think it's going to change the discovery effort. Um, it's going to need to be a tool at some level in most of our farming systems. It's just another tool that we need to use. I don't think we're ever going to go back to mechanical only weed control. It's going to be supplemented, particularly being supplemented. And we're already seeing that um, in a lot of the paddocks that have got you know, bad feather top roads grass that growers have had to go back to uh, steel in some form or other uh, to assist the chemical uh, herbicide side of things. So I see them relatively happily moving side by side. I think some of our growers, which have gone completely zero till, may end up coming back and putting a little bit of steel in strategically at the right place. But I don't think we'll ever go back to days where we totally reliant on steel. Yeah, I agree, Mark. We, we've had some real out, outburst of uh, feather top roads up here in Queensland at the present moment, and uh, you know, 90, 95, 98 percent control on feather top roads is not good enough. So a bit of strategic tillage has been brought into uh, into action, that's for sure. There's a couple of other points, which I'll, uh, more like, more like uh, comments than anything else, Mark, I'll give to you uh, later in the day, but I might just pass it back to Shannon. But Mark, that was first class. It was a really good webinar and uh, thank you very much for your time. And I'm back to you, Shannon. Yeah, thanks so much. Thanks for giving us your time today, Mark and Paul. Um, the, the link to this webinar will be up on the website later today. Um, so if you did want to go back and watch it or pass it along to your colleagues, 
Um, and if you do have any questions, feel free to email us and we can send them through to Mark. So thanks, everybody. No worries. Thanks, Mark. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Bye.